ready for a few more things. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. We got it. We got it. Oh. Wait. Right. You need to set up. What's that? Okay. Great. Decided to change the plans. We're going to test two parents. What do you think? <laughs> You could ask them questions. Um, first of all, let me thank uh, all of the students for their hard and excellent work. Uh, this is the 13th annual State of the Union contest. Uh, we had almost 400 essays submitted from 31 schools, and you guys were judged to be the best by the group of independent teachers. My office had nothing to do with um, determining who the winners were. Um, and um, the purpose of this contest is to try to get uh, the young people in our state uh, to start thinking about many of the important issues that you deal with every day that you're going to face as you get older and have an impact the country today. Uh, and one of the concerns that I personally have why I initiated this contest is that a lot of young people don't understand the role of government in their lives. Uh, and I wanted you to get thinking about that, and you guys did that in a very uh, strong way. Um, I don't know how many of you happen to see the President's State of the Union speech on Tuesday night. But you know, what this is about is to ask you, if you were President, if you getting up there in a room in the House of Representatives in Washington, which is not quite as pretty as this room, <laughs> a bit larger, where you had you know, roughly 435 members in the House there, and members of the Senate, not really one of the guests. And you're talking to those people, and you're talking to as many millions of people watching on TV. So what do you say? What well, is the State of the Union? How are we doing? What are our strengths? What are our weaknesses? Where we want to go in the future? It's about. And that's the spot. Um, uh, so that's what I kind of ask you to do with you guys in your own ways. Uh, made a determination as to what you think is most important. I was very impressed uh, by the what you wrote. I, I want to do something. Uh, I gotta, I'm a hard teacher. It's not as nice as your teachers. Uh, so I want to, before I even get the answer, what we'll do is uh, we'll go around uh, the table uh, from uh, number one, person select number one on that. Uh, you'll tell us briefly what your essay was about. I'll ask you some questions. And I want other people to jump in as well. So if you have some thoughts about what somebody is saying, you agree, disagree, there's nothing wrong with disagreement. Well, we want to have that kind of informal discussion. There's nothing to be nervous about. Just, uh, but I want to begin the discussion uh, by asking, look, in a sense, a hard question. And that is, how long do you come by what you come by? What motivates you? How do you come to your own views? What are the factors that made you consider these topics the most important? How do you develop your own worldview? Is it just simply are you repeating what your parents say? What you read, what your teacher says? How do you come to you know, independently assess your views? Who wants to jump up on that? Okay, your name is? Uh, you hold that mic uh, kind of close to you. Uh, my name's Andrew. Uh, I think it's kind of a mix of personal experience and then also just what you hear. And no, then... I'm not, I'm not. Am I the only one having a hard time hearing? Yeah. Okay. You know what? Turn the mic off. Are we turning up the volume? Uh, my name's Andrew. Uh, we got, <laughs> I'm going to say some of the things that like develop your own view is uh, personal experience for one, right? You can go around and uh, get your own information from your own experiences, but then also just listening to things around you, like the news, I mean, might not be the best source, but 
uh, corroborating evidence. Um, I don't know, just. I yeah. So my name is Josh. For everybody, I think today in the U.S., one thing we're struggling with is just multiple narratives and trying to parse out what is truth from what is false, um, and that's becoming increasingly difficult with social the rise of social media and then uh, an increasingly. Uh, we're increasingly able to communicate with people around the country and organize without having to be in person. I think that came to a head in January 6th, two years ago, uh, very clearly. Um, so I think this is just very difficult, and what has happened is everybody now, unlike 100 years ago, everybody's getting their information from wherever they want to get their information. Um, so everybody kind of has the freedom now to just validate their own opinions and become more extreme. Other thoughts on that? What about your own personal experiences, not just getting information from the internet? How does your own personal life experiences impact your views? If you grew up the son or daughter of a billionaire living in a kind of a mansion, would that have an impact on the views of growing up as a low-income person living in a trail park? What do you think? Who wants to comment on that? Did your own life experience impact your views? August, you're the unlucky person, right? <laughs> Yes, can, okay. Can you know, you? I'll try you without the mic and just... <laughs>
be a little bit louder. Whether it's their um, Okay, good. All right, let's get to work now. Uh, let's start talking about uh, the essays that you guys wrote. Okay. And the essay that was judge number one is from August Howe. Um, and uh, August is a junior at Twinfield uh, Union School. And uh, August wants to us very briefly on um, what's it all about? Be uh, so I think about um, kind of the issue of misinformation, uh, specifically in social media, and how that. Uh, I think Excuse me, could you please use the microphone so we can uh, hear you? Right, use the mic, maybe. I hold it close to you. Let's see if the mic works better. Um, yeah, so I read about misinformation in social media um, and how. Uh, Essentially, there, we don't have any way to kind of regulate that type of thing because um, social media platforms are kind of held to different standards than maybe traditional news outlets. Um, and I think that's an issue because um, even though it's really important for people to kind of be able to voice their opinion and like have freedom of speech, um, when it comes to how it impacts our democratic process, it's become a pretty big issue. And, like, Things like the January 6th insurrection is an example of people being forced into action because of kind of false news. Um, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, August writes on a really, really important issue. And it's a deep issue. It goes well beyond January 6th. Because, I'll uh, give you an example. Just the other day, I'm chairman of the committee, which has 21 members, uh, 11 Democrats and 10 Republicans. And um, I just talked to a guy who, if, who is, matter of fact, a uh, you know, pretty smart guy, and he's the United States Senate. And he believes quite strongly that, in fact, uh, Trump won the election. So if you were to tell him that his information is based on false news, he would say, uh, young lady, I know more about it than you do, and I have information, and he actually won. What do you say to him? Why do you think you're right, your information is right, and his information is wrong? Why? I think Trump lost the election. How do we deal with that issue? He's not a stupid man. Um, I mean, I would ask him where he got that information, maybe. Pardon me? I would ask him where he got that information. Okay. Um, and it is really hard to determine what information is correct. Um, and I probably have a lesser chance of being able to do that, I would say because I just have um, information from the internet. All right, this is tough stuff. And by the way, hold the mic. I think this might work better if you pass the mics around. It is very hard. Um, somebody will tell you tomorrow, I was in bed last night, God appeared to me, talked to him. And he told me that X, Y, and Z happened. The person telling the truth? Sincere, they believe it. It's tough stuff, all right? Anyone here think they know the truth? Absolutely, 100%, you got it all. All right, let's talk about it. Who's gonna judge what the truth is? All right, you want a board? How are we gonna do it? So if I wanna write on my uh, internet page, you know, uh, X, Y, and Z happen, you think it's wrong. Why don't we deal with that? And somebody else jump in. Somebody, 
And by the way, don't feel, if you're a little bit perplexed about this issue, don't feel badly. Everybody is. This is, you know, Supreme Courts, you know, wrestle with this. How do we deal with it? It's a tough issue. What is truth? And if I disagree with your version of truth in the United States, I'll give you a very good, clear example. Donald Trump, who in my view, and I don't mean to be political here, I really don't, um, in my view, is a pathological liar. I think he lies all the time. He was banned from the internet, from Twitter and Facebook, I guess. Is that proper? President of the United States. Not allowed to communicate with his constituents. Now, I think he's a liar. There are tens of millions of people who like him very much. Should he be banned from the internet? Because I think he's a liar. But thoughts? How do you deal with it? Yeah, Alexander. Um, well, I just want to say that um, it is his right of free speech, but um, I think it violates the clear and present danger when it causes uh, things like January 6th, okay. which deems it unconstitutional. Good. All right. Now, that's, now we're getting into another area. So you're saying he has the freedom of speech, but if he says something that could lead to violence and taking somebody else's life, that's a line maybe that you can't cross. Is that kind of what you're saying? All right. Alexander Wright, wrong. Thoughts on it? Okay. Lila, what do you think? Grab that mic. Um, I think it's a... Uh, Hold on, Mike, a little, whoosh, a little bit closer to you. Bring it closer to you. Yeah. I think it's a fair point if, if he says something that, like, openly goes against or, um, like, degrades or demeans something, then it would... Okay. Anyone else want to jump in that? Yep. Um, I think that there's a difference between just sharing your opinions and your political beliefs and kind of inciting something to happen towards action. I feel like anybody has the right on social media and wherever they want to say what they believe, but at that point it's not saying what you believe, it's having people act on something that might cause violence, might cause um, harm to them and also harm to others. Good. Okay, I, I guess um, this is a tough issue because even on that, where people say, well, you know, oh, Leah, you're right. And somebody said, I didn't mean anybody to be violent. I just, why are you interpreting that? You know, so you gotta interpret what somebody says. And what we call is dog whistles. You know what a dog whistle is? And, and dog whistle is where somebody really knows what they want out of it, but it doesn't look, it's like, go out and take a gun and shoot somebody. No one says that, but they give uh, signals of what they kind of violence they may want. All right, the point is, this is a very important issue. You guys have done a good job in discussing it. Nobody has a magical solution. The balance here is, do we believe that people have the right to express their point of view? Yes. Uh, do we believe that people have a right to create conditions where people might get hurt or killed? No. And how you draw that line ain't easy. So, uh, August, thank you very much for raising that important issue. Um, the second winner was, uh, maybe I um, hope I'm pronouncing it right, Justison, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, Lahu? Lahu. Lahu, okay. Justison, uh, tell us what you wrote about. Um, I, my name's Jay, and I wrote about political polarization, and in, like, in the United States, how issues are becoming more and more divisive, and that can, like, weaken democracy and hurt the government, and why we should try to target that and fix it. And my propose was an act that would help economic inequality, it would improve education, and it would create citizen assemblies. Keep going, it's a good start. You don't think I'm gonna let you off that easy. 
And yeah, I wrote about how polarization can lead to um, congressional gridlock, lack of trust, an increase in violence, and a lessened sense of community. And economic inequality is a big factor of this because it creates social divisions between groups of people. And by doing certain things like bringing up the minimum wage, improving the in income tax credit, um, improving education, especially pre-K, um, and teaching kids how to differentiate between fake and factual information, that would help to reduce the risk of extreme partisan views. Okay, who wants to pick up on, what should we call it, Justice in this? Jay. Jay, okay, that's easier to pronounce. Uh, Jay right, wrong, what do you think? Important issue? Yep. Um, my name's Elena, just, um, I completely agree with Jay on this. I think, I think that for government to be functional, there needs to be a little bit of difference of opinion, just so that like we get a wide range of issues covered in different ways. But I think when it pushes to extremism, it becomes dangerous. And personally, I read your essay and I liked your proposed solutions. So I think you, think you did a good job of that. Thank you. Okay, other thoughts on polarization? Jacob? I think you can run into a balance between freedom and anarchy. Whereas if you have complete, f if you have complete freedom, then it becomes anarchy where anyone can say whatever they want. It kind of relates back to the first one in a sense where it can push people to extremes because the people in the extremes will take the most action. And then those who take the most action will then silence out everyone in the middle. And it can create extreme polarization, which can no longer create balance. And I feel like ensuring constant voices are heard and there's a constant cycling of people in government and that it can always, like vo new voices are always being heard that way, the same voices, after spending a long time, no offense, but it can, <laughs> it, some people can, there are, sen there are other people that can get to more and more extremism because it can erode responsibility. But I think you've done a good job of that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> um, okay, further thoughts on that issue? Uh, let me throw, yeah. I think like for a democracy to be healthy and to thrive, it needs to have a variety of views, like the wide spectrum. I think the issue is though in a two party system like we have, um, generally what happens on like a multi-party system is parties attack each other without much consequence. <clears throat> so what's happened is I think small groups of each party, I think it goes back to the 90s with uh, Speaker Gingrich, um, have radicalized each other basically. And the issue that causes is that once you get to a certain point, it transforms from democracy to autocracy. So um, I like radicals and I forget the beyond conservative term for it, but this want to use violence to get your way, I think that's what happens once extremism become, goes too far. Okay. More thoughts? Yep. Um, I also think a good example of this situation taking place is how, like, the election of the Speaker of the House. Again and again and again, they had to keep redoing this election, and the Speaker had to make more and more concessions to the Republicans because a major it, it was a majority of the whole chamber that needed to be required. And in some ways, that's a good sense that it requires a large consent of the country, but on another sense, that can also hurt or actually hurt the cause because it pushes people to extremes where then they have to concede with the most extreme member of their party in order to actually get elected because it is so divided. It's not like one party can be like, oh, we're gonna get rid of those extremists. We, they have to make concessions to them because of these majority systems, which then lock it in and create one gridlock and two, it provides concessions to extremes, which leads to more gridlock and it's a negative feedback loop or positive feedback loop. Okay. Um, earlier this week, I met with the minister of, I can't remember her exact title, but from Finland. And she, uh, her portfolio includes healthcare and a bunch of other important issues. She was telling me that in Finland, 
She is part of a coalition government. What does that mean, a coalition government? Well, let me get some more hands here. What does a coalition government say in Europe or Latin America mean? Okay, uh, Joshua. I, when they're, like in the UK, for example, I, when there's not a majority in the parliament, uh, what they'll do is they'll work together to make a majority that they can work with, and then the government can stand until that, sometimes in certain countries. Well, the better example in the UK is in World War II, they had a multi-party, all the parties came together to run the war. Uh, how does our system of government, uh, what are the major parties in the United States? You all know that. What are they? Um, Samantha, what are the two major parties in America? Right, okay. Now, I happen to be an independent who caucuses with the Democrats. But by and large, the members of the Congress are Democrats or Republicans. We have a two-party system. Is that nece necessarily the case all over the world? In Europe, for example, is it the case? As I was mentioning, uh, the uh, minister from Finland was telling me that in her country, there are like 10 different parties. And she is part of a coalition government, which in order to get a majority in order to form a government and get a majority of the members of parliament or whatever the, they call it in Finland, uh, you need the different parties to come together. So I think they have four or five parties uh, in, uh, in, in that government in Finland. She represents uh, a, a particular party where there are only two representatives. Uh, that's called a coalition government. We don't have that. And what she was saying is she has to sit down with people. She is a strong progressive with people who are much more conservative than she is, who are also part of that coalition, uh, which you know makes for interesting uh, politics. Okay, anybody want to say uh, more on polarization? Okay, third essay, uh, third essay judged for third place uh, is from uh, Keenan Wallace. Uh, Keenan is a junior at Twinfield Union School. Uh, and the essay is on unions and labor rights. Keenan, where are you? Hello, uh, I'm Keenan. Okay. Um, I wrote about the undermining of uh, unions and workers' rights. Um, especially recently, um, I've been seeing a lot of stuff about um, lots of different companies, but especially Starbucks and Amazon, um, either firing uh, union organizers or giving selective pay raises and that sort of thing. Um, and this whole thing is, it was kind of just disturbing to me um, how there's no real repercussions for those kind of actions um, being taken against workers and labor unions. Uh, okay. yeah. How did you become interested in that issue? Um, a few things. Uh, my grandfather was a, um, union worker at a paper mill for about 30 years. So it's on some levels, it's personal. It's a personal thing for me. And then also just seeing it in the news was pretty, uh, it caught my attention. Okay, uh, thank you. Good, good essay. Um, my name is Harold Schultz. I started Starbucks from nothing. I created it to an international business, very popular, make great coffee. And I want to run my company the way I want to run my company. What's your problem? Um, I think the I think there needs to be regulations that ensure um, just basic rights for employees of these larger companies. I don't I don't think it's okay to uh, not have those in place. I, I think that. There is something to I be treat said. my workers just fine. I go out of my way to make sure that I have a diverse workforce. I have blacks and browns and well, I think the Muslims evidence. and Latinos, and I'm a really nice guy. I think the evidence of a number of Starbucks locations attempting to unionize would say otherwise about that kind of thing. Uh, okay. I think there's a clear a clear desire for that among the workforce. All right. No. Uh, is Keenan making an important point? 
why can't I run my company the way I want to run my company? Everyone agree with me? I have a right to do anything I want? Or, you know, I've got to obey the law, I've got to pay minimum wage and all that. But what's the problem? Alexander, you got a problem with that? <laughs> I, know. I think that uh, I think that supporting the unions uh, is a good idea, and I think that I think there should be a, a strong workforce that should I think have a say in I think, um, the company because ultimately they are providing uh, quite a they're, you know, they're the ones doing the work. They're benefiting the company by and large, and while they might not be the founders, I, I think that they're what ultimately moves uh, business forward, and I think they should have a um, say in partially how it's run and its affairs. Okay. What is the function of a union? Anybody know much about unions? No, we don't know much about unions, but all right, Keenan, why don't you tell us? Um, they can stand as a intermediary between uh, corporations and the workers to help negotiate um, better wages or working conditions or things like that for the workers by leveraging uh, strikes, essentially. Um, yeah. Okay. The workers need unions. Jay? Um, I think it's important for unions, especially if there are employees that like can't be heard by the larger corporation, and if they're getting like underpaid or understaffed and overworked, and if they think it's like that big of a problem and then they should start a union to get their ideas out. Okay, Samantha, you have thoughts on this? Um, I mean, Hold that mic a little bit closer to this term. Yes, I do. Um, I agree with Jay and everything that they said, but I also, and include in addition, I believe that it's important for them to be able to tell what's happening to them and if they're not getting enough pay, if they're not getting paid sick leave, it's important that they are able to express their feelings and so that they can continue to do work, that they can continue to provide for their families. It's not okay. fair that they're not getting paid or they're getting paid less. Okay, I'm sorry, your name is? Hannah. Hannah? What do you think about what Keenan said? Yeah, I mean, I agree with what everyone's saying. I think, like, at a certain point, um, it's important that companies can, you know, like, decide how they run it. But when it crosses the line of, like, violating human rights, that's the main issue. Um, and I think that's what unions can help with, like, making sure that um, workers are being paid properly and treated well. So... Okay, good. Um, okay, Keenan, good, good essay, and you'd be happy to know that we intend to bring Mr. Schultz up before our committee uh, to answer some questions. Um, okay, uh, next essay is on a painful subject. Um, I mean, it really is. It's, uh, and we experienced a little bit, I guess, just in this last week in Vermont, thank God it was a hoax, but nonetheless, and that is uh, gun violence. Um, no, I'm sorry, before we, uh, we are on to uh, veterans issues, I'm sorry. And uh, uh, that's uh, Jacob uh, Antonovich from uh, BFA Fairfax. Uh, Jacob, why don't you tell us about uh, veterans issues? <clears throat> My grandpa, Robert Antonovich, he was drafted into the Korean War. He was forced to serve this country against his will. And uh, at the current moment, he's, he's reaching his end of life. And when I wrote this essay, they were estimating he did not have much time, maybe even a week left. And we were trying to get hospice for him. We'd got doctors to approve it. and. Since he served, he is entitled to hospice through the VA, and um, private hospice could be there in 24 hours, but at 
88 and 90, my grandparents aren't able to afford that. And he is try, he, we tried to get it through the VA and never showed up. After a month, they finally showed up at the bed so they can roll him out when he dies, and then they left. And I think it is appalling that not enough money is allocated to community care to handle this situation. In addition to this, I also wrote about the sheer number of veterans that are homeless and how very large, like it is irresponsible that 20% of the homeless population is veterans, whereas they makes up only about 4% of the total population. And why is this the case? And for how, as much money as we spend into the military, more money needs to be spent into the VA on helping all these people. It makes absolutely no sense. And based on the information I was finding, more money is spent on making records from paper to digital than money spent on community care, which I think is irresponsible. Based on the state my grandfather is in and all the people who have served, and why are these people being left on the streets or like my grandfather who's not receiving the care he needs after being forced to serve in the military? Well, as the former chairman of the Veterans Committee, you've raised a whole lot of issues, a whole lot of very important uh, issues. Um, Jacob says that people who put their lives on the line are entitled to certain basic rights. Is he right, Lila? Um, I agree with him, and I think he is right in that, especially when you're forced into it, and maybe this wasn't your choice, um, if you are lucky enough to survive after going through war, seeing um, things and having a lot of trauma, um, I think even just basic human rights, they're definitely entitled to you. And I agree that um, it not being uh, accessible by a lot of people is wrong and needs to be changed. Um. Good. Further discussion on this issue. What do we owe people? You know, we use the phraseology, the ultimate sacrifice, but, you know, if you're in the Vermont National Guard, even tomorrow, it is conceivable. Uh, you can be called up, sent to a hot spot. I went to, years ago, more funerals than I ever believed that I would in this state of young people who died in Iraq. So what are what are folks entitled to who are put in that position? Discussion. Ella? Hold that mic close to you. So I would say definitely um, I agree with what he's saying because... Okay, um, talk into that mic a little bit. I'm sorry. Yeah. If people are especially forced to go into this kind of thing, war is very traumatic, and it needs to be taken very seriously that, especially like I said, if you are being forced into it, you are entitled to those rights afterwards. It is a violation, because if you're not being treated fairly, after you've already had to go through so many like things, like the amount of hurdles you had to go over, the amount of mental stress that people go through afterwards, definitely that alone, plus many other reasons, proves that you should be taken better care of because of what you've gone through. Well, I'm glad Jacob wrote his piece. I think uh, sometimes we don't fully appreciate uh, what veterans, uh, especially those who have been in warlike situations, go through. I remember years ago, we did a, um, a town meeting with veterans and uh, we were in Northfield. And there was a guy who was maybe around the table than this larger. And the guy said that he still, this is a guy who had fought, I think in Korea, actually. Uh, and he was an older guy. And he said he still wakes up in the night with horrible nightmares uh, about his experience. So it's very hard to put yourself in the place of somebody who has seen your the guy next to you get killed or have to kill somebody or seeing the horrors of war. Uh, and there are a lot of people, 
and I should tell you, Jacob, uh, the VA has made significant improvements in recent years. And you point out a, a, a problem, but I can tell you that it has come a long way. And uh, in my generation, we, people my age, went through the Vietnam War. And when those guys came back, they were treated terribly. And we've significantly improved the situation, but uh, obviously, as you indicate, the problems remain. Do you want to, do you want to comment on that, Jacob? I know the president addressed a lot of that during the State of the Union on Tuesday. I feel that he was a lot more like, look at all the changes we've made. And I feel we still, I feel like he left out a lot of the changes that still need to be made. Good. And, but the other issue that I didn't even write about here because of like word count, but suicide is another major thing. He said it changed from 25 to 17, and that should, 17 per day is still way too high. That should be down to zero. Well, it should be, but that raises a broader issue, because it's not just veterans in this country who commit suicide. And that raises an issue I think we're gonna discuss in a, mi a, a moment, and mental illness in America. What Jacob touches on though, and let me take it a step further, uh, Jacob's focus is on veterans, people who make a particular and very special contribution to our society. But let me take the step, uh, let me go a little bit broader, if I might, <clears throat> and go into an area where there's just a hot debate and really is the philosophical issue that divides government. And you talk about polarization or different points of view. This is the issue, and that is, what is the responsibility of government? So Jacob's point is that if people serve the country, put their life on the line, they're entitled to certain benefits. And generally speaking, there is widespread agreement with that. But let me say, all right, go beyond veterans for a moment. If you're a child <clears throat> born in America, Detroit, Michigan, and your mom makes 12 bucks an hour, what are you entitled to? Are you entitled to a good education? Are you entitled to good nutrition? Are you entitled to health care? Are you entitled to housing? Or if you live in Fairfax, Vermont, are you entitled to health care as a right? Is it just veterans who should get certain benefits? Who wants to jump in on that one? Alexander? Um, well, I think that uh, the goal, to, uh, sorry, the government's ultimate purpose is, I think, to look out for the well-being of the people and, I think, to, to keep them safe and to provide them um, with uh, services uh, that are needed. And I think that, I mean, can you just give me a moment to just think about this? All right, think about it for a second. All right, let me rephrase the question. <clears throat> I just wrote a book, by the way, which deals with this issue. 1937, long, long time ago, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, any of you heard of President Roosevelt? Okay. Gave a speech, State of the Union speech. And essentially what he said is that, hey, in America we have a constitution, guarantees you the right to vote, right to dissent, the right to picket, freedom of religion, all that stuff, it's great, but doesn't guarantee you economic rights, doesn't guarantee you the right to a decent paying job, doesn't guarantee you the right to education, doesn't guarantee you the right to health care. Now, Roosevelt was a strong progressive. Conservatives would say, yeah, why should government guarantee you that right? Why should I guarantee you the right to education or to health care? Earn it, go out, make a living, get it, good luck to you. Why does the government, should the government be responsible for making sure you have a decent paying job? So what if you earn bad wages? That's your problem, get a better job. Take responsibility for your life. What's the answer? Um, well, I would say that um, I think if the government doesn't provide things like healthcare, or education, we're gonna continue to see the poverty uh, rates and homelessness rates um, be really disproportionate and they might, they're probably going to increase because families are going to be without important rights. Um, so I think that it kind of, it doesn't, nothing will change if the government doesn't give more rights. Okay, further discussion. And again, this is a basic point. 
I have friends who are honest, sincere people, and they say, you know what? I work really hard. I work hard, I work 15 hours a day, I made a living and I took care of my family. Why do you want the government to guarantee you health care? What's the answer? Thoughts? Yep. I think in the US what, we're, what we see in terms of prices is just absurd compared to other countries. I mean, like a trip to the hospital is, it can be in the tens of thousands of dollars and college is 50,000 plus per year and then add in pre-K and child care because you have to go to work. So I think there are just so, this country is so, so, so expensive that there is kind of, I think, two layers to, or two, in my mind, answers that make sense, which is the first to cut costs, and then the second is to, for the government to pay for this. For, and I think then in the second option, there are two ways to proceed, which is like certain people can get these things subsidized by the government, but then if you're like a millionaire or a billionaire, then why should the government pay for you? You Good. can obviously pay for yourself. Okay. It's a broad issue, and already we're, we're falling way behind. <laughs> uh, but I would simply tell you, um, I mentioned that I met with this uh, minister from Finland. Uh, in most major countries on earth, for example, uh, if you got sick and ended up in the hospital in Canada, how much does it cost you when you get out? Anyone know? Anyone know? Free. Free? How's that? Because they have free health care in Canada through taxes. Okay. They pay for health care the same way your schools are paid for. It's paid through taxation. And they believe that everybody, whether you're rich or poor, should get the same health care. And you end up in the hospital, you leave. There is no charge. In most countries around the world, they are all a little bit different, but basically that is the theory. In this country, as, uh, as Joshua mentioned, you can come out of the hospital $50,000 in debt, in debt, half a million people go bankrupt in America because of medically related debt. All right, my point is that in terms of healthcare, how much does college cost in Germany? You mentioned 50,000 a year in the United States. Anyone know what it costs in Germany? No? Find out. What is the cost in Finland, Sweden? Virtually free. Virtually free. Is that a good investment for the government to make? Why? Why should I pay taxes to send you to college? I think education is really important because it gives you such an advantage once you enter the workforce and like the foundation of getting a good paying job that you can use to support yourself these days is your education. So I think cutting the cost of college or like drastically would help people be able to provide for themselves like, through adulthood because it gives you so much of it. I, I, I wish we had two hours to talk about this because this is, Jacob raised the issue of veterans and he's right in my view but it goes beyond veterans. And it, it is the philosophical divide in this country. What is the responsibility of government? Um, um, Elena makes the point that if all of our people have a good education, and in the long run, the country is better off, right? Which I believe. Uh, others disagree and say, fine, you wanna go get a good education? Great, uh, go out and earn a living, save up some money and get an education. So that's a divide, it's the two sides to the story, but it's a, it is the philosophical divide. You guys gotta think it through to find out you know, where, you, where you sit on that spectrum. All right, we're already falling behind. Let's get to um, uh, Andrew Barrett um, from Oxbow High School. He's a sophomore, wrote on mental health. Andrew? Um, so I wrote on mental health for a few reasons. Uh, I took a personal approach. Um, a lot of people in my family struggle with mental illness, whether we admit it or not. Uh, Andrew, can you raise the volume there I, um, on that machine? Does it uh, go up at all or speak closer to it? Or? All right. Um, so okay. I wrote on mental health for a few reasons. Uh, I took a personal approach because a lot of people in my family struggle with it, um, whether we admit it or not. Uh, I think it's a really important just aspect of your life, uh, mental, if 
a good mental state is important for you know your your, your workplace, your just your happiness, um, how you treat others others around you. So positive, uh, you form a positive environment, and people want to be around you. Uh, and then you know the deeper thing is just suicide, right? Recently, uh, a close friend of mine's dad suicided, I think is the correct terminology. Uh, and in America, there's not like, there's no funding, right? For getting treatment, it's really expensive, like the healthcare part. Um, and we're so advanced that it's like, why is it a problem? For people to be struggling and like have a stigma, like the community, the society has a stigmatism on mental illness. There's, um, it's perceived as a weakness in most most places in America, in men especially, uh, young men too. Uh, yeah, so I just talked about the problems and significance of mental health and just why it's so important for for people to be have available treatment and a good society to just be accepted in, right? Okay, excellent. Um, look, Andrew, thank you very much, Andrew, for your, your essay and your remarks. Um, uh, I mean, just so you all know the facts that we have a major mental health crisis in America. No one doubts that. The crisis has been significantly exacerbated by COVID, uh, which has led to people being much more isolated than they previously were. So you had kids not going to school. You're, you're, you guys, you know, a unique position. Your, your education, uniquely in modern American history, was interrupted by COVID. Uh, little kids were even impacted, maybe more. Uh, your grandparents were impacted. Uh, they are particularly vulnerable to COVID. Uh, it has had a very profound impact on the country. No one, no one denies that. We have a major crisis. Uh, what I want to say is, uh, and it's also no debate, that in, in Vermont does a little bit better than other states, but not very well. Uh, we do not have anywhere near enough mental health personnel, whether it's psychologists, child psychologists, psychiatrists, counselors. We don't have that. Everyone, uh, and Andrew's point is, is absolutely right. Uh, and that's something, by the way, Andrew, we are working on. We have put many, many, many billions of dollars uh, into uh, improved health care, but we have a long way to go. But here's something I want to raise. Above and beyond the need for more counselors, more mental health practitioners, psychiatrists on down, what else do we need to do? Why do you think there is so much mental illness in the country today? And what has COVID done to that? That's a hard question, I know. Who wants to jump in? Jacob, you want to take a shot? <clears throat> I feel like it's not only COVID, but I also think it's the polarization and the media, like the two essays, that one. I feel like those also play in a factor of people being pushed to extremes and people seeing the news and getting really emotionally riled up by it and then getting isolated at home, no one to talk it out with, no one who they might find supportive besides the people on the internet, which they can easily get in fights because there's everyone out there. And people, again, on the internet, they will erode responsibility. and it gets very heated and it can cause people to have even more problems that, and I feel like all these things all added together have severely created a lot more problems. Do you feel your generation is under a lot of stress, maybe more than your parents? How so? Hannah? I think, um, especially in the news, we're hearing about like climate change and um, all of the gun control things with like school shootings and everything and I think a lot of the pressure is put onto our generation to have to make all these changes um, and I think we're still figuring out how to do that and we're just feeling a lot of pressure and that we're going to deal with the consequences of all these issues. Okay. 
voices wasn't talk very much. Lila, jump in. Grab the mic there. Is your generation under more pressure than your parents, perhaps? Um, I think part of what puts us under so much pressure is that we don't just have the problems of now. We have the problems of the past, which for our parents' generation was not as, it wasn't the past, the past few years with like the pandemic or the war that's going on overseas that everybody's hearing about, everybody's talking about. Our parents, they didn't, they didn't have what we, or uh, the current problems as much. They just, they had their problems. And over time, it just keeps building up and building up. And so few people are actually like acting on and like fixing problems that they just keep piling up. And so the newer generations have so much, so much, so many problems so much to deal with. Right. I, I think it's, you know, when we talk about stress and mental illness, I, I think I was at uh, Essex High School. I don't know, we have, uh, do we have anybody from Essex? Yeah, I don't think so. Uh, and I spoke to these students there. <laughs> One young lady said, we were talking about mental illness and stuff, and, and she said, you know, we gotta deal with climate change and whether the planet's gonna be here for us. And we gotta deal about getting into college and whether we got the money to do that. And we gotta deal with our biology classes tomorrow. But it is in this gun violence thing, um, you know, I got to tell you, when I was a kid, and, and I always, and sometimes I actually get criticized for it because I don't talk about the issue as much as I might, because it's too horrible and painful to be even thinking about what some lunatic is going to do. But that's something that you guys are all aware of, right? And just, what, last week did you all go to lockdowns or something? Because some moron sent out something. That's something, you know, older generations never, ever thought about. So add all that together. Tell me about it. What does it mean in terms of stress? Yeah, Liam. Um, I think that it's an important point that was made that um, we, like with the internet, our generation is so just constantly exposed to everything that's going on in the world, whether it affects us or not, but it will mentally affect you whether you are aware of it or not. I think that especially with COVID, everyone was just intaking all this, like the world is dying kind of thing. And then um, added on to like the disconnectedness that we gained from not seeing anyone basically for a while. Um, do you, does your generation spend too much time? I'm gonna be dramatic here with this thing here. Do you spend too much time with it, rather than being with your friends? Is that an issue? Uh, Ella, is that an issue? Do you spend too much time on your machines, or your devices, or whatever you call it? Me, personally, I know that I do spend lots of time on social media and things like that, and I know that that has also directly impacted my life and a lot of people close to me. Um, it is my understanding that social media is everywhere and we generally cannot get rid of it. It's too big right now to stop it. So we just have to find ways to get around it and survive with what is uprising. Okay. All right, that's again, this is a discussion that we can have for a bunch of hours but we're falling even further behind. Um, all right, let's move on. Um, um, but Andrew, thanks very much for that important essay. Uh, Alexander uh, Califano is a junior at Crasserie Academy. Uh, um, Alexander, what'd you write about? Hi, um, my essay was about uh, the cases pending in the Supreme Court uh, involving affirmative action. And um, it's very likely that they will ban it. And um, I think that in response, I think Congress should uh, pass a bill that um, allows um, colleges to continue their efforts to um, admit students from um, historically disadvantaged and uh, economically disadvantaged groups. And because I think that school and, and college, I think it's not just about going to class, it's not just about taking tests, it's not just about maintaining those grades. 
It's about learning to become a responsible citizen, and I think part of that is being able to interact with people who are different than you and do come from diverse backgrounds. And I think if our campuses do not reflect the diversity that our nation, of our nation, then I think it's gonna be uh, really hard to uh, have those skills and I think to be that responsible person. Well, Alexander made, in his essay, made a, and he repeated it here, a strong point that it's, you're arguing that it's not just for the individual who might benefit, but that everybody benefits by the diversity of the experience. Thoughts, what's the argument against affirmative action? Hannah? Uh, I think people argue that it like, um, well, it'll instill those views onto current students, but I don't think that's the case just because it's important to know what happened in the past and like how we can fix that. And also it's important that we don't lose that history. Well, we're stretching a little bit here, but right now one of the issues that's out there, and I'm not going to get too political here, but there are some who think that school curriculum should not include a certain subject matter or tone it down a bit because they feel it's, you know, it's upsetting to, to young people to learn about some of the ugly aspects of American history. Should we protect your generation and younger people from ugly aspects of American history? Samantha? I think in learning the mistakes that have been made in our history is very important to not repeat them. And I think taking away, trying to hide parts of what we can learn in our education is damaging and it just makes it easier for mistakes to be repeated in Good. the future. Good. So if you study slavery, if you study what has happened to what the early settlers did to Native Americans, you got a Latino history you're going to tell us about in a bit. Uh, should we be studying those issues or are they too upsetting? Uh, building off of what Samantha said, I think it's necessary for us to study them because we can try to run and hide from our history, but no matter what we do, it's still gonna be there. And it's important for us to not erase the negative parts of our history and try to glorify our country when those were mistakes that we made because as Sam said, it will make it easier for us to repeat those same mistakes and cause a lot more pain and hurt and destruction to our citizens. Good. All right, so the debate is, I happen to agree, um, you know, um, with what uh, you guys have been saying, uh, and it is no one is or should be proud of certain aspects of our history. On the other hand, there are aspects of American history that everybody should be extremely proud of. Uh, but like every country, no country that doesn't have its ugly aspects. But I think in the end of the day, uh, understanding what happened, understanding history, learning from that history uh, makes us a stronger people. Okay, we're gonna move on. Uh, next essay is by Leah Kunert uh, from Woodstock Union High School. Uh, Leah. Um, hi, I'm Leah. So I wrote about climate change and Specifically, it's um, the effects of America's system of industrial agriculture um, driven by federal farm subsidies um, and how that's affected climate change. Um, so basically, uh, I focused on federal um, farm subsidies because basically there's are subsidies on crops such as like corn, grain, cotton, um, other crops like that. and um, the subsidies have supported a system that is um, basically just specialized farming. Um, these farms that mass produce this one type of crop over and over again, and effectively that destroys the health of the soil, um, over tilling, 
all of these, um, I mean, we saw it with the Dust Bowl, and we've known that this has been happening for a long time, and yet uh, we still really haven't done anything about it. Um, basically, the destruction of soil um, contributes to climate change because it destroys the ability of plants to effectively sequester carbon in the soil. Um, so instead of storing carbon um, in the soil, it doesn't. And so what I um, am proposing is that um, we're reevaluating subsidies and instead of supporting this monoculture that's um, very um, detrimental, um, to support a change to regenerative agriculture, which is like cover cropping, um, rotational grazing, other things like that, um, because it's, um, it'll um, help mitigate climate change and also make economic sense for small farmers, because currently um, the subsidies the federal government's giving out, a, well, 12 to 13 percent of the Forbes 400 um, richest Americans have received millions in farm subsidies, and so uh, try um, billions. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it'll help small farmers in Vermont, especially too, because I know a lot of small farmers already use many um, regenerative techniques. So it, yeah. All right, Leah. Like every subject that you guys raise, it touches on a million issues. Uh, you know, Leah's talking about climate change, talking about agriculture. We can throw in whether or not family farms are going to survive for it. Uh, all right, thoughts? Climate change, agriculture, what's on your mind? Any of you guys grew up on a farm? Leah, did you grow up on a farm? I did not grow no. up on a okay. farm. Okay, <laughs> that's all right, well. There was a time, and, and as you all know, and you know, it's interesting, we're in this building right now, this beautiful building. At the end of World War II, I think, maybe I'm wrong on this, there's something like 40,000 farms in Vermont. The odds are that all of you would have been on farms, tiny little farms separated from each other by bad roads. Um, and a lot of the business that was done in this room, you know, had to do with agriculture and roads and so forth. But that world has changed. We're down to like seven, six, seven hundred dairy farms left. Uh, all right, thoughts on climate. Let's just deal with climate. Um, Lila, you want to say a word on climate? Um, I agree with what Leah was saying and that um, solutions for climate are, it's, it's kind of complex in that We've been doing things one way for so long that shifting can throw a lot of things out of line. But I don't think I think if we don't strive to make solutions, we're really going to suffer from it. Our planet is increasingly um, becoming different than it was in the past, and these dramatic shifts in climate affect us. So I think it's important for us to take steps to um, preserve our planet. Jay, what do you think? Um, I also agree with Leah and Lila, and I think it's important to do regenerative agriculture because it's a solution to climate change that is very achievable. Even though it may be expensive, it's also achievable, and it's, it's also one of the only solutions that's like out there that seems to be it will make a difference, so, yeah. Good. Okay, well, Leah, thanks very much for writing on that very important subject. Okay, the next essay comes from Ella Matai, Matei, uh, who is a freshman <clears throat> at Northfield Middle uh, and High School. Ella? Okay, so um, I wrote my essay <coughs> about food insecurity. Um, I feel that this is a very, like, urgent matter because um, many people are facing the facts that they do not have enough food because of their area. It is either food deserts or it's too expensive for them to buy because they don't make enough money or because there are so many more places that are, like there are so many food deserts out there now that it's becoming more expensive to transport food to different places which like rises the cost of 
the food in the supermarkets or just makes it way less accessible for people. And that makes it harder for children to get their food, which is what we need. These children are the future of this planet. And if we don't support them and get them what they need, we're not gonna be successful. And as society, we have found that, we have found many ways to survive and thrive through many different things. And I think we could get over this. It's just that many people would argue it's too expensive because it would cost around $34 billion each year until around 2030. But I think that is very much worth it because if we want to succeed and have happy lives and continue to thrive as a country or as like the human race, we need to be able to have our basic needs met and to understand that if we are all not getting what we need, we are not going to succeed and people are going to be crushed by that. Okay, well, Ella, like everybody else, raises a dozen different issues, really. Um, talks about nutrition, talks about food deserts. Now, when we talk about food deserts, it's interesting. Some years ago, uh, my chief of staff here was, and I were in Detroit, right, Katie? And we were early to an event, so we drove around. I, had, I don't know that I had been to Detroit before, so I just wanted to see Detroit. We just drove around, the, rented a car, and we drove around. And we kept looking and kept looking. We could not see a grocery store. Could not find a grocery store in, one, in a very large city. What we saw in every corner was what you call, what do you call them, uh, what? 7-Eleven type thing, except maybe worse, you know, and uh, also, you know, alcohol and potato chips and everything else, could not find a grocery store. So in one sense, that's a food desert. So people, if you don't have a car, I don't know how you get the decent food there. But also in a rural state like ours, you got a food desert too, don't you? What does that mean? How, where, where would a food desert be in Vermont? Well, you guys know. If you're in a small town, Right? Do you necessarily have access to good quality food? Might you have to go in, do some of you have to get into a car and go a few miles before you get the groceries that you need? All right, and if it's snowing, it's a bit of a problem, etc. All right, so good quality food is not necessarily accessible. And then the broader issue is nutrition. Do you eat, as kids, did you grow up eating the quality food maybe that you should be eating? Are Americans eating the quality food that we should be eating? Who wants to t talk about that? Alexander, you got thoughts? Uh, probably not, but I just, um, you know, I think it kind of goes back to like the last essay almost of like, I think in order to do this, we are also taking on like unsustainable farming to meet up with the demand of it. So I think it's just kind of really tricky because we need to build it sustainably, but to get short-term gains, you might also have to take losses somewhere else, and, and the fact that it might not be uh, very good for the environment, so. Well, again, like every other, and I guess maybe one of the points of this morning is to tell you that every single issue that you raised can be discussed in a thousand different ways, and has a thousand ramifications. So when I think about nutrition, okay, access to food, right? Does everybody in America have the resources, have the money to access good quality food? No, that's obvious. If you want to go to a grocery store and get good quality, organic, free range, whatever it may be, it's a lot more expensive than junk food, right? All right, can everybody afford that good quality uh, food, organic food? No, can't do that. Um, what is the responsibility of some of the larger food companies? What are they producing for kids? Are they producing high quality food necessarily? When you see ads on TV? Yep. Joshua, what are they producing? I think in our country, there's been like too much of a focus on just making money. And you can also see this not only in food, but like fast fashion too, and um, like clothing companies uh, making clothes that cost the least amount of money possible, but then they're not as good as they used to be. Um, <clears throat> so I think there's uh, companies especially are just placing too much importance on their profits and not what they should be doing. What kind of products? Cool. All right. 
What about sugar? A lot of sugar in food? Sugar good for you? I was at an elementary school recently, and the teacher was doing a very nice job debating whether or not the kids should have chocolate milk uh, in their menu. The argument doesn't have too much sugar, does it not, and so forth. But all right, yes, um, jump in. So most sugar in like cheap foods or junk foods are is just corn syrup. I read a book, uh, I think it was Omnivore's Dilemma, and it talked about just the uh, problem with um, corn syrup because it's so cheap to <laughs> to buy and process, and or corn is cheap to buy, and then um, there's so much you can do with corn. So corns and everything, it's really unhealthy because it's too much grain for your body. So that was one of the things that... Good. Um, Very good point. So a lot of that has to do with politics, getting back to your point, all right? So if I am uh, an agribusiness guy and I can produce food cheap and I can get money from the government to produce it, maybe the quality of it is not particularly healthy. Is that right? So it's a big issue, um, and... Uh, Ella, thanks very much for raising it. Um, <clears throat> next essay uh, comes from Lila uh, McMillan, uh, who is a freshman at South Burlington High School. Lila? Um, I wrote about the... Hold that mic a little bit. Oh, no, you got it. That's good. Okay. The uh, general, like... Um, understanding around students' mental health and like the accessibility that students have and how um, how like things around them can influence them to not get what they need and how that can lead into like further problems with um, like things like gun violence, because if people can't get what they need because they um, choose not to or cannot because um, of like what they might, might have heard from it or whatnot, then they're going to have problems in the future with that. I think. So are you arguing that if people are unable to be recognized for who they are, bad things might happen? Is that your point? More or less, yeah. If people, it, and I think that um, a lot of it is people don't understand what it would be like to um, have like a mental illness or disability. So people, so things like bullying, it can be it can be worsened by the fact that they just don't know what it's like. Mm -hmm. Thoughts, Lila Wright. Do we show enough respect for people who may be not normal, but not like everybody else? I don't think we do. I think we need to end a lot of stigma because there is a lot of stigma around mental health and neurodivergence and stuff that is written about in this essay. And I think the biggest way to do that is to just raise awareness and like hold discussion so that this becomes something that's normal because it shouldn't be anything that's not. Yep. Um, I think a lot of the time, too, people with disabilities and people who struggle with these different things are isolated from their communities. I've seen a lot of times people who just don't really want to, like, interact with people who they might not understand. And so um, I think it's really important to put more emphasis on um, integrating kind of communities. And so people understand that people with disabilities, maybe mental disorders, are really not all that different from them. More thoughts? Um, I agree with what people have been saying in that 
a lot of people don't understand or don't have the knowledge of what it's like to have a disability. And then um, we are not doing enough work to make sure people get educated and can interact with people and be around people that have the different experiences than them. You know, the, um, there is legislation uh, that was passed, I don't know how many years ago, some decades ago. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, to essentially uh, prevent discrimination against people with disabilities. Uh, and one of the benefits turns out to be, uh, and it was a point, who made it? Somebody made, I think we, we talked about affirmative action. Alexander made the point. Turns out to be a, a different point than one would have thought in that kids now who have uh, people in their classrooms, for example, any of you have kids in your schools with Down syndrome, for example? You know what Down syndrome is? or other types of severe disabilities. What has happened is that it benefits not only the person who's dealing with that to be around other people, but that other people become more tolerant uh, and sympathetic. And you know, we've seen some really beautiful instances around Vermont and I'm sure the country where uh, students are so very protective and generous to a kids who have particular problems. It brings out the best in many ways. It's a very nice thing, I'll tell you, brief story, and I can't remember the guy's name, I was trying to think of it, maybe one of you know it. Uh, in England during World War II, there was a guy who had, a, apparently he had compulsive, what is it, compulsive disorder, what, what is that? Uh, obsessive, OCD. Yeah, uh, yeah, obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, and among other manifestations of his disorder, he was a, a genius in terms of cracking codes. Anyone with Turin, that's right. Is that a Turin? So this guy who was apparently not very personable, people didn't particularly like him, they put him in a room and he helped crack the German code where they would, you know, uh, communicating all over the world and help win World War II. Because his particular quote unquote disability turned out to be a genius in doing things that no one else could do. That was his weakness and strength. So he helped win, win World War II. So I think the point about tolerance of people uh, who may be different than you or I, and we're all different from each other, uh, is something that a healthy society needs to do. So Lila, thanks very much for that. Our next essay is from Elena Rogers, uh, a junior at uh, BFA in Fairfax. Uh, yeah, so I wrote my essay about the growing gun violence epidemic, which I think all of us can agree is a very severe and pressing issue. People are losing their lives every single day to gun violence. And there are ways and like steps the government can take to prevent this and reduce this crisis that aren't being taken. Uh, the two I proposed, and I acknowledge that there is more, uh, but the two I talked about in my essay was banning assault rifles and strengthening background checks on all firearms, because though we do have those, there are loopholes that people are using to purchase firearms illegally. Okay, and it turns out that Hannah Smiley uh, from Milton High School, sophomore, <clears throat> also wrote on gun violence. So why don't we combine the two? Hannah? Yeah, so I also wrote my essay about gun violence, um, and I kind of focused on some of the stories of uh, school shooting survivors, um, specifically one from in the Sandy Hook shooting, um, and she just kind of talked about the anxiety that she felt, um, and I think after the Columbine shooting, um, which I think was in 1999, and then uh, Sandy Hook, which was a little bit more recent, um, the government and everyone like in the media was talking about how we need to make a change. Yeah, I feel like not enough has changed because still there's shootings and like uh, last week, I think on Wednesday, there was like the whole um, shooting threats in Vermont and I was at one of the schools that had to lock down um, and obviously nothing really became of it because it was misinformation being spread, but I kind of dealt with some of that same anxiety 
um, that other survivors have talked about. So I think it's just important to protect everyone, especially kids in shootings and gun violence and all of that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Elena and Hannah are talk <clears throat> excuse me, touching on an issue that's on uh, everybody's minds. And again, we saw it surface in Vermont uh, just this last week. Um, there are many aspects to the issue. Uh, we we'll want to talk about the other point of view, who is opposed to what you guys would like to see and why. Um, but I also want to uh, talk about, and, and I have had, you know, sometimes when you're a senator, you have a lot of pleasant and fun things to do, like what we're doing today. Sometimes you have unpleasant things to do, like talking to, you know, parents who've lost their kids to this gun violence. So that's not a very pleasant thing to do. Um, but I want to touch on something. You know, we went through just this last week, this horrible business. What is it like to be involved when you're a teacher? I don't know how you do it in the school. The principal says we're locking down the school, then maybe a shooter or something like that. What's going on in the school? Who wants to talk about that a little bit? Hannah or uh, Elena, you want to say a word about that? Were you guys, your schools involved? Okay, talk about that. <coughs> I just want to clarify, are you asking about- Talk like, a little bit closer into the mic. I just wanted to clarify, are you asking about specific procedures or like what it just feels like to What be? does it feel like? You're okay. a kid there, what, what, what's going on in your mind? Well, honestly, it's kind of terrifying. Like even though last week turned out to be fake, um, the, the threat is still there. It's really always still there. Over the years, our, my school at least has had to crack down on its lockdown procedures because we had another lockdown many years back and our procedures were not adequate. Um, always having that threat in the back of your mind, like you never know when something's gonna happen these days, you just don't feel secure or safe. And I feel that schools should be a place where we're secure because if we're not, it affects our education and our ability to learn. Anna? Yeah, I agree with that. And um, I think like when, they, when they're announcing the lockdown, we don't really get any information about what that means. Like at least at my school, they just said lockdown. So that could really mean anything. And we, we sat in our classroom for probably 45 minutes to an hour without really knowing. And all people were, I could hear people like saying, kind of sharing some of the things that they were hearing like on social media, which was that there was like people dead in Montpelier High School and or like- Really, injured. they were saying that? There was a lot of things on social media that people were dead or injured at a lot of different schools. And that was kind of going around the classroom. So we didn't- That was on social media? Yes, at multiple different schools. That was part of the, that was when they were calling in, they were saying, like they were calling into the dispatch offices saying, that there was already people injured at the and that there was active shooters in the buildings and they had to verify that that wasn't happening. Was that, were those lies being perpetrated by the same people you think who were? Uh... Yeah, it was by like that caller that I think ended up being like an international number or something, which kind of wow. goes back to the misinformation thing. So kids sitting in classrooms were learning, but were perceiving that other class? Of... Yeah. Andrew, do you want to say a word on that? No? Okay. Anybody want to add to that? Yes. Samantha. I know that at our school, when we were getting this information, and like I saw a news article about how Montpelier was on lockdown. I have, I have a friend there who told me that she was in lockdown and that they went home early that day. And when we got the announcement, I was in a class. Some kids were told that they couldn't go to the bathroom. They had to go into the classroom because were, we were about to go on lockdown. We didn't actually, we got an announcement saying that we were stuck in school, but other classrooms also had the announcement that they were on full lockdown or like barricaded the room. So it was very uneven in how our school dealt with the situation, which was also very upsetting to me. Well, look, you know, when we talked a moment ago about mental health and the stress that your generation is under, that's horrible. I mean, I can't, there's no other word to describe it, uh, I think, uh, I don't know who just said it, Alexander, somebody just said, no, it was uh, Elena. Uh, traditionally, schools are supposed to be safe places. 
you know, in, in my generation that was the case. I don't think any older generation would ever imagine, you know, you're sending your kids to school. What's the problem? So the horrible, horrible, sick things that we have seen in recent years impacts us all. Uh, I wish I had a magical, I mean, yeah, you know, all of you know that, that school shootings are, they're very much publicized. They're relatively rare. They happen. So I don't want you to think that they happen every day in every school in America. They don't. But your teachers and your principals are trained correctly that God forbid something happens in your school. They've got to take action to protect you, right? That's their job. And they have to do that. So it is, um, you know, uh, it is just one of those things that we are dealing with now. It has to do with social media, right? It has to do with guns. It has to do with a lot of the issues of mental health. I, I can't imagine the state of mental health of somebody who would do something like that. Can you imagine somebody, what kind of person would want to frighten, terrorize young people? And apparently this goes on all over the country, right? So, all right. Uh, so that's that. I wish I had a happy ending to that story, but I don't. That's it. Um, uh, uh, Joshua Stearns uh, is at Hanover High School, which is near Norwich. And um, Joshua wrote on uh, gerrymandering. Yeah. Um, first, I just want to extend a thanks to you, Senator, for meeting with us today. Um, I think every issue ranging from like abortion rights to gun rights um, depends on who we elect and uh, even more importantly, how those people are elected. Um, gerrymandering has been a part of our political fabric for more than two centuries. Um, and I think it's important to note that it's a bipartisan issue. Uh, you can look at the 2020 redistricting to see this. Um, for example, you can look at Illinois and Florida. Um, but experts uh, believe that this particularly impacts uh, Democrats uh, because gerrymandering is particularly pervasive in southern states, um, which disenfranchises voters of color. Uh, and voters of color are one of the Democrats' most important voting blocs. Um, I don't think the solution to this, though, is a nonpartisan redistricting, redistricting commission, uh, simply because in this country we use single member districts. Um, so I think there will always be an issue while using single member districts uh, where whoever doesn't vote for the winning candidate, their votes are essentially null and void and they go pretty much unrepresented. And then there's the added issue of over the past century, our country having an explosion of population. So districts are becoming increasingly more difficult to truly represent. Um, so I think the solution to this is, like many other democracies around the world, to transition to a proportionally representative multi-member district system, uh, the type of system where you have to form coalition governments to govern, um, uh, to ensure that all Americans can have fair and true representation, because I think that's the most important thing in a democracy. OK. Uh, Joshua raises, um, like every Everybody else here has raised a very, very important issue because ultimately a lot that happens happens at statewide levels and how people are elected, uh, the nature of the political system impacts what happens. Uh, gerrymandering is a old practice in America named after a guy named Jerry. I think he was G-E-R-R-Y, right? We're from New Jersey or someplace. Is that where it came from? Massachusetts, okay. And it's a way to manipulate the political system so that you benefit. That's what it's about. Uh, it's been done throughout history, done by Republicans, Democrats, uh, done more extremely, if you like, by Republicans recently, and Democrats have kind of responded in kind. Uh, what I want to do, if you'll allow me, Joshua, because you've touched on a very important problem in America. and, and uh, I sit next in the Senate to a, a senator from Wisconsin, and she reminds me that in her state, actually Democrats gain more votes for members in the state legislature, and yet they are 
wildly underrepresented uh, in terms of members in the legislature because of gerrymandering significantly. Um, but what are the problems that we have with our political system? Gerrymandering is a very important problem. Now in Vermont, we don't quite have that problem because we got one member of Congress. So. Um, uh, but what are the political, in terms of the political system itself, what are some of the other problems that we face that are structurally uh, problematic? Yep. Uh, I think that um, lobbying has started to become a pretty big issue. Sure. Um, I think it provides an easy avenue for wealthy individuals as well as wealthy corporations to directly influence policy. Gina, do you know how many lobbyists from the pharmaceutical industry are in Washington, D.C.? No. 1,700. There are 435 members of the House, 100 members of the Senate. So for 535 members of Congress, there are 1,700 often very well-paid lobbyists to make sure that you pay the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. That's one issue, okay? What are the other issues even deeper than that? If you want to run for office, what do you need? You need money. You need money. Okay. How much money do you need? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if you want to run for the Senate, oh, yeah, I can't even remember. A friend of mine from Georgia just won re election. I can't imagine how much money was spent there, probably $80, $100 million. Uh, on his campaign, and Georgia is not a particularly big state. If you want to run in California and maybe spend hundreds of millions of dollars, what do you think? Is that conducive to democracy? Yep. I, I mean, if you look at like Canada, for example, they have the rule where you can only campaign for like, what is it, a month, a week? Um, but in this country, we have decided to, you can just campaign for however long you want. And so, that kind of, and with our, like the Gini coefficient in our country is so high because of, we just have such a high inequality, it kind of just is conducive to whoever has the most money and who have, then they can just run and they'll probably get it because they have the money. What for is it. a super PAC? Anyone know what a super PAC is? Oh, yeah, it's it's a political action committee that they don't work directly with the candidate, but they, um, they, they produce like media and advertisements Good. on his behalf. And how much money could a billionaire put into that? Um, I don't know, but I'm assuming like, again, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> An unlimited amount of money. So if you were a billionaire, and there are many of them, many hundreds, and you didn't like the senator from Vermont or the senator from California, take out your checkbook, Write a check for 50 million, you give it to some consultant who starts a pack, and you can see a lot of TV ads on him. All right. Point being, um, you know, uh, Joshua raised the issue of lobbying, which is very important. It's not the only issue. Lobbying is an issue. Probably the issue of money in politics uh, is the biggest issue because you're looking at a situation where big money can buy elections and often does. All right, so that's an issue that we should continue to be thinking about. Okay, uh, Lila, uh, I'm gonna destroy your last name. Is it Tr uh, Trigo? Trigo. Oh, it's not bad. Uh, and uh, Lila is a freshman at Burlington High School. Um, I wrote about protecting LGBTQ youth <clears throat> in schools and how Vermont is a very progressive state when it comes to LGBTQ youth. Um, like it's definitely not like this everywhere, but I still see like, hateful stickers um, in my neighborhood near my school, and there's still discrimination we need to address. Um, and connecting to other issues we've talked about, school is really supposed to be a safe space. It's where you spend the majority of your childhood, and it's where you learn all the skills you use um, in the future when you're adult. Um, and so bullying can really lead to other problems like mental health, 
um, which can then lead to suicide and homelessness. And so, and because LGBTQ youth experience increased numbers of bullying, um, you, they are really overrepresented in these homelessness and suicidal numbers. And I have a lot of friends and people in my life that identify as LGBTQ and just thinking that they are at an increased risk for these is really upsetting and I think we need to change this. So I proposed um, a bill that would not only prohibit but really prevent bullying um, based on the protected categories like gender identity and sexual orientation because I think having programs in schools and teaching these important lessons beforehand can really help when these kids grow up, even if you don't identify as LGBTQ, growing up with these protective programs can teach you a lot of valuable lessons. So I think it can decrease um, discrimination in the future. Good. Okay, discussion, Lila Wright, wrong, what do we think? August, what do you think? Um, well, I agree with you that uh, um, LGBTQ youth are definitely more at risk and they should definitely be protected. Because, I mean, like at my school, I have seen the same issue of um, bullying, essentially, of LGBTQ people, people who identify as LGBTQ. Um, and I, yeah, more stuff needs to be done, I guess. Lila, you touched on this a little bit in a different way. Um, what do you think? Grab that mic there. Um, well, I agree that the bullying um, um, poses a, a big a bigger threat for everybody because they, I mean, there's, there's, there's still people. They might perceive the world differently from others, but that shouldn't make them a target. That, that shouldn't, that shouldn't paint them in red and have like. Let me ask a question. Why would, why would one bully somebody because their sexual orientation might be different? What motivates somebody to do that, do you think, Alexander? Uh, I think uh, just um, age stigma and probably just also just not having ever interacted with some, someone who identifies as LGBTQ. I think it's very similar to, um, uh, I think, what I said in, about the affirmative action is how it's important that you need to be surrounded by people who are different than you so you can understand them and you you don't have that discrimination and that stigma and okay. stereotypes that have been around forever because then they're disproven once you actually can experience and okay. meet someone different. Good. Why would somebody be a bully? It's not just LGBT community. Yep. I think that people experience bullying for because they're not perceived as normal, as you said earlier. I think like you can look at Florida, for example, with like their don't say gay bill last year. The reason that's so dangerous is because in those early years, that's the most important time to teach about diversity. And I think this extends also into uh, issues like ethnicity, race, and gender as well. Um, I think you have to, as people were saying, teach about diversity at a young age because that's really when it's ingrained in you and it's really just a cultural issue. And it's like, how do you change this culture that's been with us for thousands of years? It's not easy, but I mean, it's possible. So. Good. Okay, Lila, thank you very much. Let us think. Uh, last but certainly not least is Samantha Ur Urbina. Uh, I finally got her name right, okay. Uh, who's a junior at BFA in Fairfax, Samantha. <clears throat> um, I wrote about an issue that I started really considering when I got into high school. So, Matthew, put that, that's a talk right into the mic. Um, this issue 
I've always kept in the back of my mind when um, I was learning about history, in, uh, especially ninth grade when we went over world history, I noticed that we never went over any history of Latin American countries. Um, when we did US history, there was no mention of contributions of um, Latinos and Hispanics throughout our history. And um, it made me feel invisible. And I've always kind of felt that way. And I think that that's a really big problem, especially because according to the 2020 census, um, we are close to 19% of the United States population um, being Latino or Hispanic or having background of being Hispanic or Latino. And because Latinos are the second largest ethnic group now, it's very important that we are, that everyone is educated and um, it will, through education, it will change the minds of people and hopefully um, in the future there will be less discrimination than what we already are dealing with. And um, it's just, it's very important to me that this changes. Well, Samantha raises a very important issue. I think she is absolutely right. Uh, Latinos are what, 19% of the population of the United States? Uh, and a growing population. And in Vermont, we don't have a large Latino population. But if you go to California, if you go to Arizona, if you go to Nevada, if you go to New Mexico, but in many other parts of the country, you do have very large uh, Latino populations. Um, Samantha, are you, much his, are you much familiar with Latino history? Yes, um, I'm second generation Mexican American on both my parents' sides. And so, Where does your family come from? Um, my mother's side is from Guadalajara, and then my dad's side is from Michoacan. I also have family from Monterrey. Um, my parents both grew up in Dallas, Texas, where it was a very large um, population of Latinos. Um, and then I never really had that kind of cultural immersion. And so it's always been a little um, hard to realize. And so I hope that, you know, when the population of Latinos being is growing, like you said, um, through immigration. And, um, I think it's very important that in rural areas of this country that um, we talk about and have these difficult discussions. Well, I, I'm glad you raised the, the issue, uh, Samantha, and I, I, I um, when we talk about history, and I think we talked about earlier movements in this country to try to avoid painful subjects, uh, you want to say a word about what the initial settlers, not only in the United States, but in Latin America, uh, did to the Latino population, the native population at the time? Um, moved them away from their homes and killed them. How many? Millions. Okay. Millions of people were wiped out. They were wiped out by disease as well, because the Europeans brought viruses that the native people, <clears throat> you know, smallpox, I think, and other illnesses that their uh, bodies couldn't deal with. It was a just almost a genocide. It's a horrible, horrible, and we don't know enough about it. We don't study it. Uh, and of course, that problem exists today. I mean, that's, we're dealing with some 10 million people in this country who are undocumented. And I talk to kids your age whose parents are undocumented, who literally every day worry about whether or not their mom and dad is gonna get deported. Kids who say they worry they come home from school, is their mom and dad are gonna be there? Or are they gonna be arrested? Uh, and I'll never forget talking to a kid your age who was in a car and his father was speeding, his father was undocumented. Driving too fast, got stopped by a cop. And suddenly everybody in the car's heart stopped beating because they didn't have identification. The cop didn't ask for it. But if the cop had, that whole family, well, not the family, the kids would have stayed and mom and dad would have been sent across the border. Try living with that one. So <clears throat> it's a very big issue, and I'm glad you raised it. All right, uh, we've gone through all of the essays, and I, I think what I learned, and I hope you learned, is that every essay that you touched on, 
A was important unto itself, but touches a dozen other issues. No issue is isolated from any other, whether it's a veterans issue or it's a mental health issue, it's an LGBT issue, uh, or whatever it may be. Um, all right, why don't we take a few minutes to wrap it up. Any closing thoughts? Did you guys learn anything from this discussion? What'd you learn? Don't be shy. J Jacob, you learn anything? Government's a complicated thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, yeah, I kind of knew that. There's a lot of issues and there's a lot of different ways to address them. Then it, it comes back to what I said initially of like freedom versus control and anarchy. It's finding the balance. Everyone has a different perspective. Everyone has different views. And as we said in the initial question, everyone has their own truth. Truth as a collective can be a very hard thing to rule out. And it's a very gray area on what people want to find. And working with government, trying to find this balance. And finding this balance is the purpose of government, as Abraham Lincoln said, uh, a government for the people, by the people. and Of and the people, by the, the people, people, for the people. people. Where did he say that? Um, Gettysburg Address. There you go. All right. So I feel that by embracing this and trying to work to make progress, find this area on balance, find this truth, collective truth, and a balance of everyone's truth, all the people get all the perspectives so everyone has a chance to be heard. And finding this balance can be difficult with as many people as there are in this country. And all the perspectives shown, all the issues, addressing all of them in their equal weight, it can be a very difficult issue, but discussions like this, prompting this discussion, can allow for change to be made, and that is how this government functions. Uh, Leo, you have any final thoughts? Yeah, I think Jacob um, brought up a lot of good points. Um, I think it's incredibly important that we are able to share opinions and work towards collective change. Um, I think that in our government, a lot of the time, at least, I've seen that it, everyone kind of thinks it's this kind of entity that doesn't really make any progress. And um, I think it's, it's very interesting, kind of, in our little circle here, how um, putting together everyone's different perspectives on all these issues, it's, it's complicated, but it is um, extremely important. And I think it's, it's a very interesting thing to, um, to learn about. OK. Uh, Ella, do you have any last thoughts? No? OK. <laughs> all right, look. Uh, I enjoyed the discussion. I don't know if you did, but I did. I hope your parents did. By the way, parents, I think you have a right to be very proud of these kids, yeah? Uh, and let me also, I didn't acknowledge, I don't know, do we have any of the teachers here who helped uh, select the finalists? We do at least one. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, we had, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Any other parents want to jump up? We, we, uh, don't be shy. Your thoughts? Any parents? Uh... Nope? Okay. I'm 
just, uh, Stand up if you could. Just uh, I'm extremely proud of all of you, all your contributions, uh, the well-written documents that you've put forth, your ideas. And I just uh, empower you and encourage you to keep going, keep doing what you're doing, keep making, having these thoughts, keep writing them down, and keep uh, spreading your message and your work. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Any other parents want to say a word? Other thoughts, parents? All right, let me just conclude. I, I think um, we are living in tough times. That's the reality. You heard it here today. A lot of very, very serious problems. Um, but I think, uh, as has been said, um, your intelligence and your decency uh, gives us all hope for the future of this country. And, and obviously, not just you kids all over the state, young people all over the country. So in the midst of all of the difficulties that we encounter every day, and there are many of them, um, you know, keep going forward with a vision of how we can address those problems, as difficult as they may seem, uh, and a vision for a better and brighter future. So thank you all very much, and parents, thank you for being good parents. <laughs>